Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for our special Brave Girls virtual story time of Dancing Hands, how Teresa Carreño played the piano for President Lincoln with author Margarita Engel. Now, we're not going to get through the whole book today, but we're going to get through some really exciting stuff, and we hope that you'll be able to finish it on your own. So my name is Emma, and I'm going to be your host today. And a few housekeeping notes. Margarita will be answering questions at the end of her reading, and you are welcome to ask your questions at any time during the program by using the Q&A function on the tool Bar. And for our younger audience, you can get an adult to help you with that. And you can ask your questions at any time, but we're going to be waiting until the end for Margarita to answer them. But with that, I would love to introduce our author. Margarita Engel is an award-winning Cuban-American author of many verse novels, memoirs, and picture books. Hi, Margarita. Hi. Uh, Margarita. Margarita served as the National 2017 to 2019 Young People's Poet Laureate. She is a three-time U.S. nominee for the Astrid Lindgren Book Award. And Margarita was born in Los Angeles, but developed a deep attachment to her mother's homeland during childhood summers with relatives on the island. Margarita, we are so excited to have you today to read Dancing Hands, and I'm really looking forward to this. Thank you so much for inviting me. I would like to just begin by introducing why I wrote Dancing Hands. It's actually a companion book to Drum Dream Girl, which is about a Cuban girl who a hundred years ago became a little over, a little under a hundred years ago in the 1930s, became the first female drummer in Cuba. I was so amazed when I learned about Teresa Carreño that I wanted to do this companion book. And the same illustrator, Rafael Lopez, did these incredible illustrations. Teresa Carreño was Venezuelan, not Cuban. I'm Cuban American, you might wonder why I even heard about her, but a lot of my Cuban relatives have lived in Venezuela at various times for, and some for quite a long time. I tried to visit Teresa Carreño's uh, place of birth in Venezuela. At the time, I wasn't able to go into Caracas. I wasn't permitted to go into Caracas, but I did go to another town that Barquisimeto, that's called the City of Music, where they actually give each child a musical instrument. So I had some background for the inspiration of children playing music in Venezuela. In the fall of 1863, Teresa received an invitation to play for President Lincoln. He had already freed the enslaved people with his Emancipation Proclamation, and the Union had triumphed at Gettysburg. He often took comfort in musical performances, including concert by Teresa's teacher, her piano teacher there. So if you want to know more about the historical background, there is a note at the end of the book. But I'm going to start by reading about the first half of the book in English, and then I'll read it in Spanish. Uh, the translation is by Alexis Romay, a Cuban poet who lives in New Jersey and has translated most of my books, and he does a wonderful job. I write in poetry, and translating poetry is a unique skill. On the first page, we see Teresa with her father in Venezuela, learning to play the piano. And so the first page reads, when Teresa was a little girl in Venezuela, mama sang lullabies while papa showed Teresita how to let her happy hands dance across all the beautiful dark and light keys of the piano. At first, making music seem magical. But soon Teresa learned that playing a piano could be hard work, 
Sometimes she had to struggle to make the stubborn music behave as she practiced gentle songs that sounded like colorful birds singing in the dark and light branches of a shade dappled mango tree and powerful songs that roared like prowling jaguars beside towering waterfalls in a mysterious green jungle. If Teresa felt sad, music cheered her. And when she was happy, the piano helped her share bursts of joy. By the time she was six, she could write her own songs. And at seven, she performed in the peaceful chapel of a magnificent cathedral, playing hymns that shimmered like hummingbirds. Music was Teresita's delight, but suddenly when she was eight, a war changed everything. Guns, blazed, swords flashed, and poor papa had to rush the whole family down to the seashore and onto a ship, into a storm where wind howled, waves rolled, barrels tumbled, ropes snapped, and clouds bucked and kicked across the wild sky like angry mules. By the time the ship arrived in New York, Teresa felt lost. She was homesick. How could she ever play happy songs again in this unfamiliar country where she did not know a single friend? Few people spoke Spanish and all around her curious strangers stared and whispered as if her whole family belonged in a museum of oddities. Worst of all, there was fighting here too, the horrible civil war, North battling South as soldiers marched and newspaper boys hollered about victories, defeats, funerals and fears. Without a new piano, Teresa would have felt even more lonely, but soon she discovered that wherever one is, some people are friendly, drawn together by songs. Musicians came to her home, playing along while they listened to the dazzling notes of her dancing hands. Determined to improve, Teresa practiced graceful waltzes and sonatas, booming symphonies and lively folk songs, her strong hands accepting the challenge of life's many dark and light moods. People began to call her the piano girl. Her picture was in the newspaper and on posters advertising concerts where she performed with great orchestras that invited her to play solos. Teresa triumphed in enormous theaters where children clapped and cheered while their parents stood up and tossed roses. With Papa at her side, she traveled to elegant cities, and by the time she was 10, the piano girl grew so famous that she received amazing invitations, including one so special that she could hardly believe her eyes. President Abraham Lincoln wanted her to play for his whole family at the White House. And I hope that you will read the rest of the book so that you'll find out how the concert went. It was really very fascinating. And uh, we know about how the concert went, not from photographs because those were rare at the time and there were none taken of that particular concert, but we know from um, her interviews from her biographers who interviewed her later in life. She actually became a very famous opera singer as well as pianist and composer later in life. And um, 
ended up living in the United States for a long time and then in Germany for a long time and only visiting Venezuela. So I'm going to read the same part of the book in Spanish now. And I will show the pictures again. Cuando Teresa era una niña en Venezuela, su mamá le cantaba nanas mientras su papá le enseñaba a Teresita a dejar que sus alegres manos bailaran a lo largo de las hermosas teclas oscuras y claras del piano. Al principio, hacer música parecía algo mágico, pero Teresa pronto aprendió que tocar el piano podía ser un trabajo arduo. A veces tenía que esforzarse mucho para que la testaruda música se comportara como era debido mientras practicaba canciones suaves que sonaban como pájaros coloridos que cantaban entre las ramas oscuras y claras de una mata de mangos bañada por la sombra y canciones poderosas que rugían como jaguares al acecho, junto a cascadas imponentes en una misteriosa selva verde. Si Teresa se sentía triste, la música le levantaba el ánimo y cuando estaba feliz, el piano la ayudaba a compartir esas explosiones de dicha. Para cuando cumplió los seis años, escribía sus propias canciones, y a los siete tocó en la pacífica capilla de una magnífica catedral, unos himnos que centellaban como los colibríes. La música era el deleite de Teresita, pero de repente, cuando cumplió los ocho años, una guerra lo cambió todo. Las armas de fuego tronaban, las espadas destellaban y su pobre papá tuvo que sacar a toda la familia a la carrera hasta la costa y montarse en un barco rumba una tormenta en la que el viento aullaba las olas rompían, los barriles daban tumbos, las sogas crujían y las nubes daban coces y patadas a través del cielo salvaje, cual si fuesen mulas enfurecidas. Para el momento en que el barco llegó a Nueva York, Teresa se sentía perdida. Añoraba su hogar. ¿Cómo iba a poder tocar canciones felices de nuevo en este país extranjero en el que no conocía ni un amigo? Poca gente hablaba español. Y a su alrededor, curiosos desconocidos los miraban fijamente y susurraban como si toda la familia perteneciera a un museo de cosas raras. Y lo peor es que también había una guerra aquí, la horrible guerra civil. El norte peleaba contra el sur mientras los soldados marchaban y los niños que vendían periódicos anunciaban a gritos las victorias, las derrotas, los funerales y los miedos. Sin un piano nuevo, Teresa se habría sentido incluso aún más sola, pero pronto descubrió que donde quiera que uno esté, alguna gente es amistosa y se reúne mediante las canciones. Los músicos iban a su casa y tocaban al compás mientras escuchaban las notas resplandecientes de sus manos bailadoras. Decidida a mejorar, 
Teresa ensayaba elegantes valses y sonatas, sinfonías estridentes y animadas, canciones folclóricas, con sus manos fuertes que aceptaban el desafío de los tantos estados de ánimo sombríos y alegres de la vida. La gente comenzó a llamarla la niña del piano. Su foto estaba en el periódico y en los carteles que anunciaban conciertos en los que tocaba con grandes orquestas que la invitaban como solista. Teresa triunfó en teatros inmensos en los que los niños aplaudían y vitoreaban mientras sus padres se ponían de pie y le tiraban rosas. Con su papá a su lado, viajó a ciudades elegantes y para cuando cumplió los 10 años, la niña del piano era tan famosa que recibió invitaciones increíbles, incluida una tan especial que ella casi no podía creer que lo que veían los ojos. El presidente Abraham Lincoln quería que tocara para toda su familia en la Casa Blanca. Es que, espero que puedan leer la otra parte del libro para averiguar cómo salió el concierto. Me fascina la valentía de Teresa Carreño. I'm fascinated by the courage of Teresa Carreño. Now, many brave girls are brave doing physical things, you know, flying an airplane or running in the Olympics. Uh, there are so many ways of being brave. Teresa Carreño was brave in a different way. It was an emotional courage because to, to perform pre, for President Lincoln required courage just because he was so famous and he was the president of the United States. She was a refugee. She had been welcomed to the United States by musicians. And I'd love to uh, think that you'll consider the way in which refugees are welcomed at various times in history. There are many Venezuelan refugees arriving in the United States right now, and we can compare whether they're being welcomed in the same way. But her courage was uh, more, we could say, confidence. It was an emotional courage, the confidence to perform under such uh, pressure. I'd also like you, I hope, to think about the way the book is written. Perhaps there are some very sad parts to this story, a war in Venezuela, becoming a refugee, the storm at sea, a war in the United States, the struggle against uh, slavery. So, How did I manage to write it without be, be, without it ending up being a sad story? It's written with hope, and it's written with the musical language of poetry. I'm not a musician myself. I don't play the piano like Teresa, but I do love the music of language, and poetry is musical language, and I think that poetry allowed me to tell this story in a hopeful way, and it has a hopeful ending. I think poetry helps to leave us with the feeling of hope and the feeling of uh, joy. Poetry makes me happy, and I hope it does make you happy, too. I hope the book makes you happy. I hope you can admire her courage as I do. Thank you so much. Muchas gracias.
Thank you so much, Margarita, for uh, reading those that story in both Spanish and English. Um, and again, for uh, for those of you who are interested to know what happens uh, to Teresa when she plays, um, you you may uh, we encourage you to check out the book from your local library or to um, purchase your own copy from your favorite independent bookstore. So uh, we, if you have a question, you can put it in the Q&A. We've got a lot of really great questions coming in. I don't know we're gonna get through all of them, but we'll do our best. So um, from Ms. Erickson's third grade class, um, we have a question from Madison who wants to know if you learned to speak Spanish or if you grew up speaking Spanish. I grew up in the United States. My mother is from Cuba. My father is from was from Los Angeles. And uh, they met when my father traveled to Cuba. They got married and moved back to Los Angeles. I was born and raised there. So, But my mother didn't know English well when I was very little. So she still spoke a lot of Spanish to me, and she read to me in English. Gradually, as she learned English, she uh, sp spoke and read to me in English as well. But I would say that I grew up learning both. And... I probably, because I was little when my mother was speaking Spanish to me, and later as she started speaking more English, I might have forgotten uh, Spanish if I hadn't continued to travel. But we did visit her relatives in Cuba during the summer, so it would be a three-month visit and uh, stay with my uh, abuela. Uh, and then as an adult, I've traveled a great deal too. So um, the answer is basically both. <laughs> I grew up speaking Spanish and I also um, traveled in and continued using it. Well, thank you for that. We also have um, two related questions from Ms. Erickson's third grade class from Spencer and from Wally, and they wanna know when you started writing. You know, I started writing when I was very young. Uh, by the time I was, uh, I loved poetry, even as a child. And by the time I was uh, going to school, I walked to school and walked home. And I kind of would uh, make up poems to the rhythm of my footsteps. But remember I said that poetry is musical language. It has both a rhythm and it has various what are called poetic devices that give it musicality. Poetry doesn't have to rhyme, but it has uh, many ways of sounding musical, and one of them is rhythm, and that can be the rhythm of footsteps or hoof step, hoof beats. You know, if you're riding a horse, or uh, your heartbeat. Uh, there are so many natural rhythms, the sound of wind in trees, all of those things would work the, their way into the poems I wrote as I walked. But I didn't write the, always write them down. I wrote some down, but not all. So I was doing this by the time I was probably six, seven, eight, nine, and uh, Later, I actually studied science in college. I became a botanist and agronomist, studied plants and agriculture, but I didn't stop writing poetry. And gradually, I uh, went back to poetry and started writing for young readers. And I've always been very happy that I was able to combine science and poetry. 
That's wonderful. So you've said that poetry is kind of your favorite instrument. Um, mine would probably, like Teresa, be piano. I grew up playing piano. And we'd love to know what your favorite instrument is, and you can share that in the Q&A. Um, so while you're sharing your favorite instruments, I have a few more questions for you, Margarita, and it's related to your writing. So uh, Daniel would like to know what the first book you wrote was. And related to it from Miss Erickson's class, Gracie wants to know who inspired you to write. My first um, book was actually a prose novel for adults. My first two books were prose novels for adults published back in the 90s. Um, but when I started reading children's books and young adult books. Uh, I read widely. I read everything. And when I started to realize that it was possible in children's literature to write long books that told a single story through linked poems, I would just fell in love with the form. It's called a verse novel. And in addition to, you know, the picture books, I also write a lot of children's and young adult verse novels now. And I've, I will very frankly say that I have never wanted to return to writing for adults. I love writing for young readers and writing in poetry. And the reason I love re writing for young readers is that I feel like I'm communicating with the future. I feel like there's a chance that long after I'm gone, somebody might still, um, at the age when I fell in love with poetry, you know, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, or a teenager, read one of my books and feel inspired to uh, try writing their own. And um, that's an amazing feeling. Thank you so much for sharing. And we're getting some answers to favorite instruments. We've gotten the flute, the drums, organ, piano, and singing. So we've got a very musical crowd here with us today. And thank you for sharing all of that. Um, let's see. I think we've got time for maybe two or three more questions. So... Um, let's see, could you, um, Maddie from Miss Erickson's third grade class would love to know a little bit more about how you came up and wrote the story of Teresa. Well, I, I read about Teresa and was amazed that she had, you know, performed a concert for Abraham Lincoln but that it wasn't something I had learned in school. And I wondered, you know, why do we only think of, um, you know, refugees coming to the U.S. in terms of the 20th and 21st centuries? Why don't we acknowledge that there were so many um, people doing amazing things here already? from all over Latin America. Um, many, Cuba's greatest poet spent more of his life in New York than, you know, Jose Marti than in Cuba. These are, these are stories that I feel like uh, have been overlooked by historians. And I feel like it's time that we help to bring these people back into history, people who have been forgotten. In general, I feel like people who have been forgotten by history books in the US are usually women and people of color. Thank you for sharing. Um, so we've got, I'm gonna ask two more questions and they're both about you and your writing. Um, we have a number of students from Miss Erickson's class who are asking a related question, which is, if you can, Margarita, do you have a favorite book that you have written? 
You know, one of my favorite books that I've written is actually my memoir, Enchanted Ear, which is also published in Spanish as Aire Encantado. And it, because it's about my childhood uh, trips to Cuba, my summers spent there, uh, when I, by the time I was a teenager, it was easier for a U.S. citizen to walk on the moon than to visit a grandmother in Cuba. So those summers I had when I was younger were very important to me. And then I wasn't able to start returning to Cuba again until I was an adult. Um, it's the hostilities between the two countries persist. The travel restrictions persist, but they did start to loosen. And so that's one of my favorites. Another favorite is one that is not very well known at all. It's called The Wild Book, and it's stories my abuelita told me about her childhood growing up in Cuba um, in the early 1900s. She had dyslexia. It was a struggle for her to learn to read, but she loved poetry and um, uh, loved the reciting of poetry out loud. Well, those both sound like wonderful books, and I would encourage everyone to go uh, check them out from your local library or from your favorite uh, independent bookstore. You can purchase a copy. Um, and then final question, are you planning to write a new book? I'm always writing new books. You can see my two newest there right behind me. My newest picture book is actually a National Geographic a uh, story about a rescued baby sloth in Costa Rica, and I got to travel to the Sloth Institute there. It's illustrated with photographs instead of uh, artwork. It's absolutely beautiful, and there's nothing cuter than a baby sloth. And then uh, above it, you see my newest uh, verse novel for young adults. It's a love story for teenagers, but it's also... Uh, an environmental uh, story about uh, climate activists who plant trees. And it's a refugee story about the Cubans who walk from South and Central America trying to reach the U.S., even to visit relatives, not to stay, but just to visit relatives. Cubans are very rarely allowed to enter the United States directly anymore, and they have to uh, walk or uh, come on a raft. And it's it's a tragedy in terms of, uh, of family families being separated. So, but it's a love story. I, it, it's written very hopefully. I believe that. Uh, environmental activism is just so important right now. There's, if there's one thing you can do in this life right now, go out and plant a tree. We, well, need, those, the oxi we need the oxygen. Yes, we, we do love our trees. Well, thank you for sharing those two stories and we look forward to seeing what book you have next. Margarita, thank you so much for joining us again for Brave Girls Story, uh, Virtual Storytime and for sharing the powerful story of Teresa Carreño. Um, and for more, you can visit uh, margaritaengel.com where you'll find resource guides for teachers and more information on Margarita and all of her wonderful books. So for all of our attendees today, Thank you so much for your questions. Thank you so much for sharing your favorite instrument. Um, and we hope to see you again at another Brave Girls. Thank you again. Thank Margarita. you. And my favorite instruments are La Maraca. From I brought those from Cuba as a child. They're oh, thank an you indigenous Taino instrument. Thank you for sharing. All right. Well, everyone, be safe, stay healthy, and have a good rest of your day. Thank you so much, Margaret. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.